Welcome friends. Today we are about to see the topic fermentation equipment and uses. The objective for this would be to know about various kinds of apparatuses or equipments that are housed in a fermenter or a bioreactor and the several functions they perform for the perfect operation of the bioreactor. The vessel in which microorganisms are cultured and we get a product for the mass scale starting from a substrate by incorporation of microorganisms or some biological agent is known as fermentation technology and the vessel where they are cultured is known as the bioreactor or fermenter. The sizes of fermenter varies depending on the need and we can see there are several in line. Firstly, the cell culture bioreactor, very small in size. Then we have shake flask, again small in size, followed by laboratory fermenters and the pilot scale and finally the plant scale bioreactors. Let us quickly see how they look like. A typical bench top cell culture bioreactor looks exactly like this. This is the bioreactor and you can see that over a monitor and regulate with the control panels which are meant for regulation. Followed by the shake flask, a very commonly used instrument in the lab and very adjustable ones, simple to use, can be used on a shaker, simple shaker that is available in any microbiology lab. Then we can see here a benchtop laboratory bioreactor, slightly different from cell culture. These uses mainly microorganisms. And here we can see several parameters or equipments which are about to be seen in detail in this lecture. This is a pilot scale bioreactor and as we are proceeding forward, you can see the size is increasing. And this is a typical plant scale bioreactor as we know by the name of industrial bioreactors and they can have high sizes and we can even get products gallons and gallons of it. Now why exactly are we going to use these products and the bioreactors? Basically several products can be produced in these kinds of bioreactors, ethanol, glycerol, lactic acid, acetone and butanol, alpha amylase, one of the enzymes, several other enzymes can be produced and accordingly they have several uses. So as we see these products have lot of industrial uses, somewhere medicinal, somewhere pharmaceutical, some in the food industry and likewise but the common feature all of these will use a biological agent more so a microorganism for the product to be produced. And that is why as we are going to grow microorganisms, we require a kind of sterile environment as well as properly controlled parameters like pH and temperature. This is the general structure of a bioreactor and we are going to see each of these in detail. We definitely will require an agitation system that is something to mix the contents within the bioreactor. Then we will also be using a sparger or a oxygen delivery system into the bioreactor which is mostly housed at the bottom. There are thermal jackets for temperature control. Then we have sensor probes for pH and temperature sensing. Likewise air entry and several other equipments in a bioreactor. And the main purpose of the bioreactor is to give a suitable environment for the growth of the microbe so that a sound product with proper yield can be obtained. The product can be a cell biomass itself which means it is just the cells that we are growing or it can be a metabolite in the sense some products that are given by the organism where we derive only the product and not the cells. And it can also be some bioconversion product, meaning just one step reaction where an incorporation of microbe is required so that a substrate can be just converted to a product in a single reaction by some microbial enzyme. 
This is the world's largest industrial fermenter. It is an airlift fermenter and it is still existing. You can see the dimension here 200 feet high and 25 feet in diameter. Let us now understand each individual parameters in detail. Firstly, standard geometry of a stirred tank bioreactor. Now, as already mentioned, fermenters differ depending upon their need. The commonest use is of a stirred tank bioreactor, which is shown over here. You can see the geometry, how it looks like. It is mostly a cylindrical in shape with an aspect ratio of 3 is to 1. This aspect ratio means the height is to diameter ratio. Now, whatever size we take of a bioreactor, we cannot use the whole bioreactor as a working volume, meaning there should be some space left out on the top and that is considered as the head space volume. The total working volume is just this much, which is estimated to be approximately 70 to 80% of the total bioreactor height. Now, why so? This is because sometimes during production, there may be foaming or may be pressure building. So some room may be allowed so that even if there is a pressure develop or foaming, the whole height of the bioreactor is not used for the working volume and will remain some head space on the top. Now we will see the agitation system. It is very important that the contents inside a bioreactor is mixed evenly. There are bioreactors wherein no mixing is required, but in most cases, because it is a huge and plant scale bioreactor, mixing is very important. And that is why the agitation system. In most cases, agitation system looks just like this. There is a rotor or a drive motor, and then we have a complete shaft from which impeller blades are attached. This is just like an ordinary blender as we know, but obviously have specifications and different varieties used for specific purposes. A stirred tank bioreactor essentially has a agitation system because we call it a stirred tank and stirring is essential. It is housed in the central position of the bioreactor. Agitation system can be top entry or can be bottom entry. Now, if we go for a top entry impeller or agitation system, what happens is the seals are properly done. The motor structure definitely requires a lot of support. So this is briefly kind of a disadvantage. But if we look into the bottom entry impeller, we will see that because the shaft is almost at the bottom and there is a gravity of the whole of media on this. So most of the microbial cells and other solid particles generally deposit in this area and cause problem with the ceiling. So most often we go for a top entry impeller. Now, other than the motor and the sealing part, let us look into the blades that we are using for the mixing part. Now here we will see two kinds, that is radial flow impellers and axial impellers. The first one represented here, a typical example of a radial flow impeller is a Rustin turbine, which we are seeing essentially has a disc at the center and then there are blades projecting away from the disc. So this is a four bladed Rustin turbine and this is a six bladed Rustin turbine. Basically what happens is if we are using a radial flow uh, impeller, the flow of the liquid because of mixing takes place on the radial direction which is shown here in this diagram, radially directed directions of the liquid flow. We will talk about the flat bladed impeller or an axial impeller in our next few slides. But let us first briefly understand more about the radial flow impellers. Radial flow impellers are very effective in mixing, but they do have a shearing effect. What do we understand by the term shearing effect? This is the cutting action, which is shown very nicely in this diagram. Because of the blades originating from the disc, the, if a bubble, air bubble, or a microbial cell, if they move in past these kinds of blades, they will be cut and made into smaller pieces. For a bubble, this is very essential because when we are aerating 
or introducing air if the bubbles are made into smaller sizes they would be distributed well but let us consider the case of a cell if the cells are being divided or cut the cell do not exist and as such we have lower counts of cell when we are using a flat blade like this radial flow impellers so the shearing action is very important whether on bubbles or on the cells more damaging on the cells thus if we are planning to use filamentous fungi which are large side cells we should avoid the use of a radial flow impellers and move on to better ones like the axial flow impellers where shearing is less this is a typical photograph of a rashtan turbine which is again a radial flow uh, impeller you can see here the flat disc and these are the vertical blades this is also a rashtan turbine next we move on to the axial flow impellers now these are just directly uh, attached to the axis and there is no disc and that is why we differentiate these two and the flow of liquid is also different let us see this axial flow impeller if we find here the liquid movement is basically down and then top so the circulatory movement of the liquid is like this while in case of a radial flow it is circulated like this radially now most of the time when we are using a filamentous fungi or cells which are shear sensitive meaning if the cells break then there is damage to the product being formed we opt for a axial flow impeller a typical axial flow impeller looks somewhat like this now the blade number of blades may be different but most often it is 3 or 5 here also we see a uh, axial flow impeller this is the latest uh, type wherein the shearing is very very less because as the liquid will fall on this there will be mixing from this part down and then top so this is equally very important as we move on to shear sensitive products and we will see a uh, latest again another latest one of the intermig impeller which has come very recently and this is slightly different it is an axial itself but uh, it has several blades just attached to the sides so that more of uh, shearing can take place in this area while less shearing will take place in this area can have a diagram here of an intermig impeller which is an axial in operation no discs are attached while this axis contains the blades there are two blades here it can be more so the number of blades when increased the shearing effect becomes more so we can have shearing from this part in the later part or the peripheral parts of the bioreactor while the centrally located parts will not be having too much of shearing so this is how we have seen the agitation system let us look into the oxygen delivery system now this is very important because aeration is required in most of the stir tank bioreactors and we have four different apparatuses equipped for the total oxygen or air delivery system it includes an inlet air filter then a sparger there is a condenser and followed by an exit air filter aeration system essentially has spargers which are meant for the entry and proper diffusion of the gas which is being brought from outward pipe into the bioreactor contents now spargers can be of different types the first one is a porous sparger which just is the material itself porous in nature so that the air can diffuse into the hole of the bioreactor contents there are certain problems obviously with this where clogging is the most important problem then we have orifice sparger which is the second in category and most frequently used where we drill required sized pores onto a ring structure and calling it a orifice sparger then followed by a nozzle sparger which is just an opening a uh, kind of wherein a whole lot of air can flow in this is used only in certain cases best is a combined sparger agitator one where in the agitation system itself we saw right now about the blades we can have pores in the wells so that the uh, pores from the wells can generate the air into the system we will minimize the use of some amount of power 
then followed by dynamic and intrusive spargers. These are all very specific, required for specific uses. A sparger, the orifice one, looks just like this. This is the air inlet and there is a ring and orifices or small holes are created into the ring system. This is very important to note that the holes are at the bottom of the ring, not on the top. This will allow the air to move down the bottom and then up so that aeration is obtained even in the lower part just below the sparger. This is how exactly it would look like. This is a sparger and there is a impeller situated just above it. This impeller will not only mix the contents, that is media and cells, but will also be used for the mixing of the bubbles. Included in the oxygen delivery system is a membrane filter, which is housed outside of the bioreactor so that fresh and pure sterile air can enter the bioreactor. Otherwise, there will be contamination and product yield will, will deteriorate. So, these are generally made of Teflon and it is housed in a polypropylene housing. This filter looks somewhat like this. In this picture, we can see this air filter which is exit air filter meaning it is used for the exit air and we have also one for the inlet air and this is a condenser meant to condense any of the air that, that has coming out with water vapor. The air system is again important because it also reduces contamination. What happens exactly is, this picture represents when there is no aeration, when we have pressure inside the bioreactor as Pi and pressure outside the bioreactor as P0, if the fermenter is being cooled down, that is after the operation, after the product is produced, when the reactor is cooling, there will be Pi which will be lesser than P0 and as such contaminants will be very easily drawn in into the bioreactor with several of the outlet systems that are there. But if we have a air entry all the time what happens is contaminants will be forced away because P or pressure inside is greater than pressure outside. So this equally not only used for aerating but also for maintaining sterility. Then we are seeing the temperature control. So right after the aeration part, how exactly temperature in a bioreactor is controlled? Basically temperature may rise or may fall depending on the reaction that is go going on in the bioreactor. So there are sensors which are meant for sensing it. Most often temperature sensors are very very sensitive and they will tell us even a 0.01 difference in temperature. Now there is a set point which is set in the fermenter and any deviation from this will call for the temperature to be controlled. This is a jacket which has been housed but jacket cannot be used for all kinds of large scale bioreactors. In small scales we can go away with the jackets but for large scale what we do is several rounds of cooled or hot water as required are circulated. In case of the first diagram, as we can see here, the water can be allowed into the jacket. This is a typical jacket fashion. Then we can have the coils which are wound around the bioreactor outside or external coils and water can be allowed in these pipes. This is a coil which is inside or internal coil within the bioreactor. This is also an internal coil but in a baffled fashion and this is a completely external heat exchanger like plate heat exchangers often housed. This is expensive and most often we follow either this or this in the industrial level. In the lab scale we can follow this one. Then we are seeing the foam control system. Basically most often in bioreactors foaming is a problem. We provide certain protein contents for the media but due to mixing in a stirred tank container often foam gets generated as we can see here on the top. This foaming would cause the rise of the height of the working volume and may at times even touch the outlets and may cause in problems of contamination. Sometimes even product is also lost due to foaming. So this should be checked. And for this there are two types. One is a mechanical foam breaker and the other is a chemical foam 
antifoaming system. This is a chemical antifoaming system wherein antifoams which are uh, several kinds natural antifoams and synthetic antifoams. The natural antifoams include some plant oils like linseed oil, rapeseed oil while in case of the typically synthetic ones we have silicones and like which are used and they are kept already there and as required due to sensing we can go, go on increasing the amount of antifoaming. So this shows the production of foam once antifoam is added they will work on as because they have the surface uh, active agents and they will clear up the foam. And otherwise we do have mechanical foam breakers as well which are sometimes housed with the impellers and they can break the foam or cut away the foam just as an agitator do. Then we are seeing the pH control system. Here also again we definitely require sensors to test the pH and depending on the need alkali pumps are there which will pump in alkali if the pH is falling while we have an acid pump which will introduce acid into the bioreactor if the pH is rising for the maintenance of the pH inside the bioreactor. Then we move on to baffles and if you can see here these are thin metal strips which are attached to the walls of the bioreactor. They may be 6 to 8 baffles in a cylindrical kind of a bioreactor and they are generally used to deviate the vortexing. What is this vortex? If a medium is continuously agitated then there will be the formation of a V or a vortex that can be eliminated if we are using the baffles. These uh, generally also help in proper mixing of the contents. So we have seen a whole lot of equipments which can be used in a bioreactor system for the proper maintenance of ambient conditions required for growth and productivity brought about by a microorganism. With this kind of a idea we will briefly have to see exactly an industry should have all these and they should also think about containments like going for the GILSP or good industrial large scale practices which means these must and must be maintained so that the organisms are not eliminated out into the environment do not cause any ethical problems or any personal damage and equally well we have sound and good amount of yield from a product.